All right. You probably have heard that uh, Iran uh, attacked Israel yesterday. And uh, a map on the screen, you kind of gives you, uh, will pull you into the Middle East. Uh, just uh, a footnote, friends, that uh, why, why do we keep our eyes on Israel? Because God does. When you think uh, Jesus walked through Israel on his time on earth, and he ascended uh, to heaven, he's coming back to Israel. We know Israel will be there for the long haul. So you don't have to panic or worry Uh, It will be there. So, uh, you know, depending on who you listen to via the media, it's important that you read your Bibles because that's where you get the truth from. So just uh, 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 a quick deal. So Iran, they are a major player. What is that, a drone or what? It's something. Okay, Iran, they are uh, a major player in the terrorist uh, happenings around the world. Uh, They have uh, supplied Hamas, Hezbollah, that attacked Israel back in October 7th and continue to do so. Anyway, they uh, they, uh, are are, uh, sending, you know, drones, rockets, etc. Here's Israel, this little country right here. That's where all the that's all the action, man. And um, so we've been hanging out in Iraq, you know, in the book of Daniel. And that's modern day. Anyway, we need to pray for, for Israel. It looks like they suffered no casualty. A 10-year-old girl was hurt with some shrapnel. That was it. The, uh, the uh, Iron Dome, David's sling defensive equipment that shoots stuff out of the sky. Uh, It's excellent uh, equipment that has protected Israel. And uh, we want to just continue to pray uh, for their safety. That's what the Lord desires. He he loves the Jewish people as he loves all people. But uh, um, let's do that. One more thing before before we do that. Uh, I'd like to have all the young people stand and you're probably thinking how old do I have to be (laughs) or how young I have to be and uh, I was talking to to Mary Schultz before Schulte before the gathering she's got a birthday this month and she says I'm going to be 77 and I said man it's great to be young how about it it's great to be young 77 is young and um that's pretty cool. So, let's have you guys stand. Um, I know you're all throughout the auditorium. Well, if, uh, let's say 18 and under. We'll simplify it. As Iran has sent missiles into Israel, uh, the enemy of your souls, young people, which is the devil, you may poo-poo the idea that there is a devil, but the fact of the matter is Jesus says there is a devil, so that means there is one. And he has come to steal, kill, and destroy. He's after your life. He's after your life because you have been created in the very image of God. Because of that, he wants to thwart the plans that God has for your life. And as we have been walking through the book of Daniel, we realize that Daniel and his three friends stood against the grain that uh, the culture was pushing. And uh, they stayed true to their core values in challenging days. And so, um, along with this attack on Israel yesterday, uh, we are fully aware of the attack that the enemy is, is um, presenting to you. 
And we want to let you know that we support you and that we pray for you. That you're valuable in the eyes of God. And so, let's pray. Father, we pray for our young people that are within the confines of this building. Some are serving right now, and we're grateful for that, Lord. And We thank you for the day that they were born. We thank you for those nine months that you were knitting them together in their mother's womb and writing a book about their life even before they took their first breath. We're grateful that you have placed them on this planet for such a time as this. And Lord, because you love children, we realize that um, that you didn't leave, you're not placing them here to become a casualty spiritually. You're placing them here to make a difference for the kingdom of heaven. And we pray for the the core of each one of them that they would stand as Daniel stood long ago in a very difficult culture, in a very challenging time in history. And we want these young men and women to know that we as their spiritual family will pray for them, will encourage them, will support them because we want to see them finish strong, Lord. I pray that they will become embedded in your word, the Bible, that their parents will take this war seriously and train them as uh, to stand alone for you. And we think about how Iran shot drones and missiles at Israel and how the Iron Dome and David's sling took them down, taking care of 99% of them. Lord, we know that you have given us everything we need to stand for you. You have given us uh, your word. And those missiles that the enemy shoots at us, Lord, at these young people, may they hit the shield of faith and fall to the ground, not doing any damage, Lord. And so, here we are. Very simply saying, we're standing in the need of prayer, oh God. We pray for Israel, your hand of protection on them, for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for each of these young people, that the favor and blessing of God would go before them, surround them with the great resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Give them the courage to make wise decisions that would honor Jesus Christ. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Yeah. This is not a game. We are not coming to church just to fill in our spiritual duty for the week and punch our card and go home and be the same. We have come to meet with the Almighty God. He's alive. And he's working. Let's let him do his work in us. Okay, you should have your outline today, and and, um, I have mine. I have mine. Those of you watching online, you could pull it up on the church webpage. And uh, a pastor tells a story about, um, he received a, an email from a man in his community that uh, had never attended church and never attended his church in the community. We're going to call this man George for simplicity's sake. Is that okay? We'll put a name tag on him. His name is George. And he was dying. He was brought home to die. And uh, one day, George was at home with his remote 
as he was in bed and he turned the television on and it just so happened that the church in his community was broadcasting their Sunday gathering. And he watched it. And at the conclusion, the information of the church came up on the screen, and so he wrote it down, and he emailed the church and said he would like a visit from the pastor. So the pastor went to George's home to visit him, and when he walked in and saw George, he definitely realized that, yeah, this man was near death. The clock was ticking. And so they, they began to have a conversation and George began to tell the pastor about his life growing up as a boy, that he had gone to Sunday school, but as an adult, he basically checked out of the church, checked out spiritually with God, just signed off on it. But as he is coming near the end of his life, he realizes that he's got to get things right. And he asked the pastor, is that possible or is it too late for me? And the pastor began to present the gospel to George, talking about Jesus coming to this planet, growing up and going to the cross to pay for the sin of George and for every person to be buried and on the third day come out of that grave. And... um, The pastor ended up asking George, hey, do you, do you need to get right with God? And um, the man expressed his need. Yeah, I, I, I have not been the best man. I have done a lot of bad stuff over my life in which I do regret. And I do need the Lord's forgiveness. And I, I do need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so he went on during this conversation and he he talked about how he had recently apologized to his daughter for the way he had treated her. He offered forgiveness to his ex-wife. He wrote letters to people that he needed to say thank you to. He was getting his relationships in order before he died. But still, in the back of his mind, there was something that kept knocking hard on him. It was the glaring intention that had been there for years, and that was, at some point, he said, I must get right with God. Maybe you're here today, maybe you're watching online, and that same the glaring intention in the back of your mind has been playing over and over and over again. Man, I, I've got to get right with God. I've been neglecting that relationship. I've been stiff-arming God. I've pushed God out of my life long enough. I need, I need to do something. And so those intentions may have followed George for a long time, but here's the good news. God never gave up on him. No matter what he did, No matter how long he lived his life without God, God never gave up on him. God kept pursuing him and putting that thought that George needed to get right with God before he died. And so when George understood that it wasn't too late, man, he, it was like a a load was lifted off him. In his bed, he began to weep, thinking it wasn't too late, that there was hope. And so it was that day that George placed his faith in Jesus Christ, put his trust in the Lord, confessed his sins, repented, and allowed Jesus Christ to come into his life and make him a brand new person. And so the next day the pastor came back with a Bible for George, and this is what the pastor said. George picked up the Bible with his weak, weakening arms. It was a Bible that he could read and grasp. In his final days, it was always by his side. He'd put it off a long time. He'd made wrong choices, but eventually he decided he needed the Lord. This man showed up 
by sending me one simple email. And it changed his eternity. Aren't you glad for that, friend? When I look at Nebuchadnezzar and I see this man who is such a pagan, ungodly, demonic-inspired man, where God never relented, kept pursuing him over and over again so that Nebuchadnezzar would finally relent like George and say, man, I got to get right with God. (laughs) Is that you today? How is your relationship with Jesus Christ? Because do you realize that he created you? He knitted you together for one purpose, and that purpose is is to have a relationship with him. Isn't that cool? The God of the universe knows everything you think and say and do and want to do. And he loves you and he wants to have a relationship with you. Man, that that is amazing. And we're grateful that we have a God like that. But just like George and just like Nebuchadnezzar, what happened? Pride got in the way, didn't it? Pride gets in the way. Pride says, I can live my life the way I want to live it. I don't need God. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, put it this way. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. And so if you came in today or you're watching online and you've been carrying pride with you, Today would be a great day to unload it, man, to give it to the Lord. James 3.16, this verse uh, speaks strong about pride, and this is the half-brother to Jesus. James was the one that said Jesus was a nobody until he came out of the grave, and then he put his faith in his half-brother and became a pastor, wrote this book of James Check this out, Forever, for wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. Can I put a picture on that verse for you? The way I see it, when there's jealousy, selfish ambition, by the way, is another word for pride. You want it your way. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to get it my way. That's selfish ambition. That's pride. There you will find disorder and evil of every kind. So if you are full of selfish ambition, here's the deal. You are opening the door to demonic activity in your life. Why is that? It is if Satan comes with a truckload of every kind of evil and he backs up on your front lawn and he dumps it over you and your home. That's what that verse means. You are opening the door. Why? Because it was Satan himself, the worship leader in heaven, who created a storm in heaven because he wanted to be just like God. Pride came in, and he got evicted from heaven. And so when you start manifesting selfish ambition, pride, you you are modeling the character of Satan himself. How many of you want to do that? You don't have to raise your hands. You can lift your eyes, whatever. But No, we don't want that. We don't want that. We would never sign on for that. But that's what it is. So, let's go to Daniel chapter 4. We're going to read we're going to read the first 3 verses and then the last 4 verses. Because this is, um, this is the cool stuff, man, that God did in Nebuchadnezzar's life. Verse 1, King Nebuchadnezzar, chapter 4, sent his, this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. I want you all to know about the miraculous signs and wonders the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs. How powerful his wonders. His kingdom will last forever. His rule through all generations. That was some shouting material right there. Huh? Yeah, and if Nebuchadnezzar was here, man, he'd be, he'd be pretty fired up. 
Then at verse 34, this is the tail end of the chapter. After this time had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven. My sanity returned, and I praised and worshipped the Most High and honored the one who lives forever. His rule is everlasting, and his kingdom is eternal. We get to live. Think about that. The kingdom of God is eternal. That's what we're part of. This is not some temporary thing, man. It comes and goes. You get voted out of office. No, he is king eternal. All the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the people of the earth. No one can stop him or say to him, what do you mean by doing these things? <laughs> when my sanity returned to me, so did my honor and glory and kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored as head of my kingdom with even greater honor than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honor the king of heaven. All his acts are just and true, and he is able to humble the proud. What is Nebuchadnezzar doing, man? He's putting the endorsement on God. He recognized how proud of a man he was, and he said, God can humble the proud. And I'm living proof. Isn't that cool? Man, God is so good. He is so good. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the hope it gives us. Man, like George, man, at the end of his life. You know, every other guy would have said, nah, it's too late, man. You messed up too much. Sorry. No. Jesus, you were there waiting. And you're waiting here today. For each one of us to make up our minds. Is it time to get right with you? It did for Nebuchadnezzar. It can be for us. And those watching online, we thank you, Lord. Do a good work in each one of us, we pray. We need your help, God. We need you to work in us. We want to become more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so you have your outline there. We're going to zip through the first several points here. I left them in because this is an outline for chapter 4, and if you're, uh, you haven't been around lately, you can uh, go back online and check it out. Um, so a king's letter, number one, verses one through three, we, we read that, those verses, Nebuchadnezzar's all fired up because of what God did in his life, and uh, he can't keep quiet. He can't, he can't think about it, you know, just think about it. He's got to tell people, and that's what he did. Two, a king's fearful dream. In uh, verses 4 through 7, uh, in verse 5, But one night I had a dream that frightened me, and I saw visions that terrified me as I lay in my bed. I was thinking about a dream I had this week. I don't, you know, you never remember everything about it, but all I remember is uh, I had to do something that I didn't want to do in this dream, and I was feeling the tension in the dream to do it, and then I thought, I can just wake up, <laughs> and I'm free. <laughs> I'm free. <laughs> Isn't that cool? And you think, man, if you're stuck in a dream, God would just keep you wired into it till the end, you know. No. He gives you the freedom to open your eyes and walk out of it. That's pretty cool, man. That's pretty cool. And so um, Nebuchadnezzar... It, it, he seemed to be locked into it. And he said, man, the dream frightened me and it terrified me. Number three, a king asked for Daniel's help. So his wise dudes, the wise company guys, they couldn't help the king. And um, it doesn't seem like they ever could, actually. And Daniel comes on the scene. The king asked him, Daniel, I need your help. And this dream, Nebuchadnezzar broke it down to two parts. Nebuchadnezzar saw this tree that was flourishing. And then the second part of the dream, the tree was cut down on a stump bound with iron and bronze. And, um, and that was it. Number four, Daniel interprets the dream. Um, upon hearing this, verse 19, 
Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, was overcome for a time, frightened by the meaning of the dream. And the king said, go ahead, tell me, the, tell me what it means. In verse 20, the tree you saw, Daniel said, was growing very tall and strong, reaching high into the heavens for all the world to see. It had fresh green leaves and was loaded with fruit for all to eat. I like that, don't you? I have two pieces of fruit every day as a reminder to this story. No, I'm just kidding you. I'm just kidding. I was eating two pieces of fruit even before this. I was preaching this. So. While animals lived in its shade, the birds nested in its branches, that tree, your majesty, is you. You're the tree. And guess what? You're going to get cut down. Boom. There's going to be a stump that's left behind. And so verse 26, but the stump and the roots of the tree were left in the ground. This means that you will receive your kingdom back when you have learned that heaven rules. That's a promise from God, friends. The stump was left in the ground as a reminder to Nebuchadnezzar that he would lose his kingdom for seven years. But when he put his faith in God, he, he would come back and be king over Babylon again. That was a promise. It's another example of God keeping his promises in the Bible. And so we're grateful that God didn't sign off. Didn't sign off on George. Didn't sign off Nebuchadnezzar. Number five, Daniel confronts the king's pride. Verse 27, King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. Daniel, yeah, we hit this last week. Um, Daniel, even though Nebuchadnezzar was ungodly, Daniel had a burden for his soul. Stop sinning and do what is right. Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps then you will continue to prosper. And so Daniel goes, you know, presenting this bad news but giving a message of hope. Please, Nebuchadnezzar, will you, will you see where your life is headed? Stop. Do what's right. Be merciful. Number six, the reward for pride. And there is always a reward for pride. It's more of a price that you pay for pride. Verse 28, but all these things did happen to King Nebuchadnezzar that he had dreamed what Daniel said would happen. Twelve months later, he was taking a walk on the flat roof of his royal palace in Babylon and as he looked out across the city, he said, look at this great city of Babylon. By my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my residence to display my majestic splendor. He's all fired up about himself, isn't he? You know, we've seen it happen in these first four chapters, man. It's all about Nebuchadnezzar. But Nebuchadnezzar learns the hard way. And... A.W. Tozer puts it this way, I have met two classes of Christians, the proud who imagine they are humble, <laughs> Isn't that good? and the humble who are afraid they are proud. <laughs> there should be another class, the self-forgetful who leave the whole thing in the hands of Christ and refuse to waste any time trying to make themselves good. They will reach the goal far ahead of the rest. <laughs> I like that, man. That's good. That's good. You know, we see that God gave Noah 120 years for the people to realize, hey, I'm building a boat. Uh, a flood's coming. You need to get right with God. They, they didn't seem to care. Jerusalem, after Jesus was crucified and rose, was given 40 years to repent, and they chose not to. And then Rome came in and destroyed the city and the temple. But here we see Nebuchadnezzar, you know, at night. He's got his coffee, bowl of ice cream, close by. And he's walking around, man. Wow, this is amazing. I, man, look at what I have done. Whew, this is beautiful. And um, I should be on the front cover of Time magazine, he's telling himself. Man, that's what I should be doing. Come on. And... 
he's, he's looking up the processional avenue from the front of his palace. Poof, lions sculpted all the way up and down the avenue. Uh, you got the hanging gardens of Babylon that he built for his wife, and that was considered the one of seven wonders of the ancient world. Think about that. Whew. Next to the gardens was the great temple of Marduk, you know, the most beautiful temple on the planet at that time. Next to the temple was a, a tower that was 228 feet in the air that you could see from all around the city. There were 53 other temples in the city as well. And so Nebuchadnezzar's walking around and there's, there's two shorter walls. And then next to those shorter walls on the outside are two wider walls that are almost 300 feet tall. And you could run four chariots side by side on those walls. You would say, oh man, who could ever breach this great city of Babylon, right? How could this city ever crumble? Nebuchadnezzar says, man, I am so good. It's beautiful. It takes my breath away. He's all fired up. Winston Churchill put it this way. He was asked, doesn't it thrill you to know every time you make a speech, the hall is packed to overflowing? Churchill replied, it's quite flattering. But whenever I feel that way, I always remember that if instead of making a political speech, I was being hanged, the crowd would be twice the size. That's keeping perspective, right? That's perspective. So we have to ask the question, uh, pride versus humility, where do we tend to land in our own personal lives? Uh, there's a book called Humble Brag. It's the Art of False Modesty written by Harris Whittles back in 2012. He kind of got ticked off with social media and how he felt people were bragging modestly about themselves on social media. You know how that works. Don't you? You don't? He says, I, I was somewhat annoyed by social media. He says, all of a sudden it was acceptable to brag so long as those brags were ever so thinly disguised as a transparent humility. Right? I remember uh, when I was in sixth grade, it wasn't that long ago, <laughs> I was on the middle school basketball team and that particular game, I, I, I had a, a good game, evidently, because one of the parents after the game came up to me and said, Bob, you played a great game. And I didn't know how to respond. So false humility crept in, and I said, no, I didn't. Isn't that weird? I didn't know how to respond. And so I cloaked it in false humility. It's kind of weird. But I've learned over time that as a, even as a follower of Christ, we can accept thanks, compliments, people that encourage you. You can say thank you right to their face. I appreciate that. But here's the deal. When you get alone, you say, Lord, I thank you. It's all because of you. And so you've learned to deflect Praise. Because that's where a lot of people get in trouble. They start believing what people say about them. You know? And they go, they go loopy. And so in order to keep your feet on the ground, go home and wash your own dishes. <laughs> Do your own wash. Change some diapers, man. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that, that'll help. Um, you know, so, so um, I think that keeps us healthy when we're able to give him, Jesus, all the glory, the honor, lift up his name. So the, I want to ask you, when was the last time you made one of these following statements? Uh, I was wrong. Anybody recently? Um, you were right. I was wrong, you were right. <laughs> uh, I should have listened to you. 
I should have, but I didn't. Um, I like your idea better. I like your idea better. See, that, keeps, that keeps us in a good place, a better place than uh, letting pride grow and infest itself. Professor Gene Twenge of San Diego State University believes we've gone overboard in telling our children how special they are when we should be showing them their responsibilities to other, others. In other words, it's not about your, you know, what your child wants. It's about how that child can help other people, right? Researchers believe that the self-esteem movement, you know, in the, began in the 80s has something to do with the explosion of narcissism in our culture. As an example, Professor Twensgabe points to the version of uh, Frere Jaca that's sung in a lot of preschools. Some of the lyrics are, they've picked up, I am special, I am special, look at me, look at me. One of our boys, I'm not going to mention who it was, was in kindergarten. And uh, he came home after school one day and said, yeah, they were, the teacher had us sing, we've got the whole world in our hands. And it, it didn't sound right to him. Because it's, he's got the whole world in his hands. Who's that? God. God's got the whole world in his hands, Right? He's got the whole world in his hands. You know, so we're bringing God down. We've got the whole world. No, we don't. No, we don't. God's clear. He would not give his glory to anybody else. And, um, and so while these words, verse 31, were still in his mouth, a voice called down from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. You are no longer ruler of this kingdom. Verse 33, that same hour, the judgment was fulfilled and Nebuchadnezzar was driven from human society. He ate grass like a cow. He was drenched with the dew of heaven. He lived this way until his hair was as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. God gave him a dream to say, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm giving you a chance. It was 12 months from the time that that dream was interpreted for him to humble himself before the Lord and he chose not to. And so he became like an animal for seven years. Then, number seven, the king promotes the one true God. Verse 34, after this time passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven. My sanity returned. What do you do, friend, when your relationship with the Lord is right? You, you can't do anything else but what? I praised and worshiped the Most High. See? I praised and worshiped the Most High. We did that this morning. We should take full advantage of that. And um, just as God promised seven years after Nebuchadnezzar went into becoming like an animal, he came out of it and he realized, oh, I'm not so good after all. <laughs> I'm not so important after all, am I? Um, recently, there was an article titled, Famous Atheist Says He's, He Identifies as a Cultural Christian. Richard Dawkins, by the way, that's who that, that is. A famous atheist, evolutionary biologist, Richard Dawkins, explained he identifies as a cultural Christian. In an interview after learning Ramadan lights were hung on a street in the UK as opposed to hanging lights to celebrate Easter recently. Dawkins was referring to the mayor of London turning on 30,000 lights for Ramadan, the Muslim holy month, on the cusp of Easter weekend on Oxford Street. Check this out. He's an atheist. I must say I'm slightly horrified to hear that Ramadan is being promoted instead, Dawkins said. I feel that we are a Christian country. The dude's an atheist. <laughs> See? Isn't that weird? So I count myself a cultural Christian. I think it would matter if we substituted any alternative religion that would be truly dreadful, he told the media. 
Dawkins said if he had to choose between Christianity and Islam, he would choose Christianity every time. The comments were a little were a different tune than the one Dawkins took when he authored the infamous book called The God Delusion in 2006. Some of you may have heard about that, where he ridicules believers, followers of Jesus Christ. John Stone Street in the uh, editorial in uh, Breakpoint summed it up this way. Of course, this isn't the end of Dawkins' journey. Given the things he's said lately, Christians should be quicker to pray for him than to say, I told you so. Pray that God in his kindness would open the eyes of Dawkins as he did for Saul of Tarsus. Perhaps he too will be confronted by a Savior who asks, why are you persecuting me? Even more, we should pray that this atheist candid admissions are a wake-up call to a Western world who wants to feast at Christ's table without bowing at his feet. The God who raised Jesus from the dead is more capable, more than capable of reviving a secular society. That's good. The point is, Richard Dawkins, I believe, God's working on him. He's bumping him along, right? And so we need to continue to pray um, for for him, for his soul to get right with God. And <clears throat> you know what's interesting, by the way, verses 34b through 37 on the tail end of chapter 4, the verbs are indicate a continuous action. In other words, this attitude continued. So when he's worshiping and he's praising, it's, it's not just a one and done when I go to the temple, you know, Once a week, I'm going to do that. No, it was continuous. Nebuchadnezzar went on to rule uh, another seven years after coming out of it. And the first thing he did was praise the Lord, man. The second thing he did, he acknowledged the sovereignty of God in verse 35b. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the peoples of the earth. Nobody can stop him or say to him, what do you mean by doing these things? Nebuchadnezzar finally said, he's God and I'm not. (laughs) The light went on. Number three, Nebuchadnezzar gave a joy-filled witness to God's grace. Verse 36, my sanity returned to me, so did my honor and glory. My, My advisors, nobles, sought me out. I was restored. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honor the king of heaven. All his acts are just and true, and he is able to humble the proud. So glad it's in the Bible. Walking in humility, friends, that's a good thing to live. We're going to transition to God crashing the party, Daniel 5. We're going to do a little quick intro here. 30 years have passed from chapter 4 going into chapter 5. Uh, That's when Nebuchadnezzar lost his pride. He gave up worshiping these false gods. He ruled seven more years of a pro-God agenda culture in Babylon. Now it's been 23 years since he's died. And unfortunately, these spiritual renewals that took place, revival that took place in Babylon has just kind of died along with him over time. And you're going to see a list of kings that followed after him. Nebuchadnezzar's son was awful, also known as evil. Merica succeeded him, but he only reigned two years. Why? Because his hungry power brother-in-law, Nereglissar, assassinated him and stole the crown. Well, after a six-year reign, Nereglissar died and his son, Labishi Marduk stepped into power and his rule lasted only a few months because he was murdered by a coup, a takeover, led by Nabonidus. Nabonidus spent his, most of his time on the throne away from the city of Babylon because at that time, Babylon was starting to become weaker and weaker. And he was trying to secure the, the borders of Babylon strengthen them. And so what he did 
He appointed his son, Belshazzar, to co-rule with him while he was on the road. That's where we land today in chapter 5. Unfortunately, when you look at King Belshazzar, he received none of the benefits spiritually from Nebuchadnezzar. Only one, and that was pride. He was a very proud man. And we see that Belshazzar has his nose up in the air, just like Nebuchadnezzar did in the early days. So number one, wild party at the palace. There's a wild party at the palace. Verses one through four. Many years later, King Belshazzar gave a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking the wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver cups that his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, remember Nebuchadnezzar? Went into Jerusalem, went into the temple, took all the stuff out of the temple. He wanted to drink from them with his nobles, his wives, and his concubines. So they brought these gold cups taken from the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. And while they drank from them, they praised their idols made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. What's going on around Babylon right now? It's not good. Because when you go to the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had dreamed in Daniel 2, remember the different kingdoms? Daniel said, Nebuchadnezzar, that's you. That's Babylon. It's the gold. But there's another kingdom coming behind you. It's going to be silver, the chest and the arms. That's silver. That's the silver kingdom. The Medes and the Persians are going to follow in behind you. Guess what's going on outside the walls of Babylon right now when chapter 5 is being taken? The Medes and the Persians are camping outside the city walls. They're on the brink of assaulting this city, taking it over, destroying it. What's King Belshazzar doing? He's fully aware of what's going outside the city walls, but as a diversion to try and keep morale up inside the city walls, we're going to have a drunken party. We're going to have fun, man. We're going we're gonna to party as if we have forever to live. Not good. It's not good. So here's the king. Yeah, I see the Medes and the Persians out here, but we've got, we've got the Euphrates River flowing through our city from north to south. We've got plenty of water. Plus, we have stored up enough food inside the city walls for 20 years. We're good to go, man. That's a long time. Freeze-dried food, <laughs> bottled water. Hey, huh? they're all ready to roll here. So the king is basking in self-confidence because he's thinking these dudes, there's no way, there's no way they're going to be able to breach these walls. And so um, as you read verses 1 through 4, which we already did, there's a word that keeps popping up there, drink, drank, drinking, that keeps showing up in those first four verses. So literally, in the original language, that means they were getting drunk. That's what they were, they were parting. And we can, we can also say that there was a lot of immorality going on inside that banquet hall. There was, it wasn't good. It wasn't good. What's interesting is archaeologists were able to excavate this banquet hall. And they say that this party was held on October 12th, 539 B.C., isn't that interesting? Historical documents. They also unearthed the, the, the banquet hall, so around Babylon and this banquet hall, they excavated that as well. So verse 2, while Belshazzar was drinking the wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold silver cups with that his predecessor Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple in Jerusalem, and he wanted to drink from them with his nobles, his wives, and his concubines. And he goes with this order, hey, hey, man, we are having such a blast, told 
the servants to go into the storage room and get the, the cups that were taken out of the temple in Jerusalem that had not been used up to this time in Babylon. Mocking God. Those cups that were taken from the temple were considered holy in the eyes of God because everything, the temple and everything in the temple was considered holy in the eyes of God. Second Chronicles 7.16, For I, God is speaking, have chosen this temple and set it apart to be holy, a place where my name will be honored forever. I will always watch over it, for it is dear to my heart. God declared the temple and everything inside of it to be holy. That word holy means to be set apart for. Set it apart for. For special use, not for everyday use. A footnote to that is, friends, that you and I, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit resides inside of us. 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 17, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you are actually the temple of the Holy Spirit? The temple that was built in Jerusalem that housed the cups and every other piece of material that was used towards worshiping God was considered holy and set aside for special use. Bill Chazar, because of his pride, is taking these cups and literally toasting to the idols and mocking God to his face. And friends, let me tell you something, man. As a follower of Jesus Christ, we need to realize, be reminded of the fact that we are, God sees us as holy, holy. We should not be participating in what everybody else is doing in our culture today. There are distinct lines and boundaries that God has given us in his word to follow, to say, I want to be like Jesus. This is what the Bible says, and I will follow it. Not what popular opinion is, not what social media says, right? And so it's a reminder going back 2,600 years ago into Babylon. The Medes and the Persians are about to breach the walls. Babylon is about to be displaced in history. And these people are drinking it away, parting. God is speaking today as he spoke in that banquet hall 2,600 years ago. We should be listening. We should be fully aware on the timeline in history, biblical history, timeline of where we are living today, right now. And we need to be serious about it. This is not some game where we can go party and live it up and all of our problems will go away temporarily and the next morning we wake up and we're right back in it again. Friends, there's a battle raging. And today, like George, it's time to get right with God. If you've never put your faith in Jesus, today is the day. Like George, realizing Jesus went to the cross to pay for his sin, your sin, my sin. Sin will keep me out of heaven. But by putting our trust and faith in Jesus, our sins are forgiven. Our names are written in the book of life. We have a guarantee of being with the Lord forever. How about it? Lord, today we thank you for the great reminder that this life that you have given to us, you desire that it, we make it count for you. 
It's not about us. It's not what we want, what we desire, Lord. It's all about you. It's your kingdom. It's your character, Lord, that we want to model. We want to present Jesus accurately to the people that you bring into our lives. And Lord, will you help us to realize the days that we're living in um, hmm. the clock is ticking it is even these moments we've had together here this morning are gone they're going to be gone and never come back again that's why we need to take full advantage Lord when we sense the spirit of God speaking to us And if you're here today and you've never put your faith in Jesus, you, you, like George, you can say, Jesus, I realize that I'm a sinner. Sin will keep me out of your holy presence. But I also believe, Jesus, that you're the Savior of the world, that you did go to the cross to pay for my sin dead in full. Not part of it, but all of it. So today, I want to get right with you, Lord. I want to have that relationship that you've wanted to have with me for so long. And so I surrender to you. Forgive me. Forgive me of my sins, Lord. Thank you for exchanging my sins for your righteousness. So when your father looks at me, he sees me as righteous and holy because I've been forgiven. Man, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for that. In Jesus' name, we thank you. And Lord, I pray for the rest of us today that maybe have been wandering, uh, cruising along as if we've got everything together. Will you awaken us today, Lord, to live for you wholeheartedly?